consultant in Brisbane anyway with some very high level clients and and, and you find that you you learn still learn as you go along and day to day you think that you may have seen everything but there's always something that comes up that's new and surprising there are always things new and surprising that come up there's no doubt about that and and I learn through the organizations I work with in different problems that may come up or things that come up that are not necessarily problems but also I'm constantly learning in through research and doing new courses because um, I think it's very, very important because, to me, education is the greatest gift we have. And the day we stop learning is not the day we stop. It's the day we actually start to retreat. We go backwards. Mm. I agree. I agree with that. We both sort of have this passion for a continuous development of ourselves and in all kinds of stuff. But I just want to get talk a little bit about, uh, we'll talk about your research a bit later on, which is very interesting. But for the moment... Um, just talking about the course, you know, what we, I know we both sat down together and decided that perhaps an MBA would benefit greatly from a business coaching uh, module. And of course, we actually give a standalone diploma to the students once they have that completed with it. So they de facto become, I suppose, business coaches in their own right. There's one thing you stress in the lecture, to, uh, Brian, the difference between a business coach and a business consultant. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Is that something you can elaborate on? Yeah. So I suppose to put it in a simplistic form is um, a consultant will advise and will come up with ideas and advise people on, you know, well, possibly you should consider this course of action or that course of action or have you thought about this or whatever. And some consultants may be rather forceful sometimes, Um I know a consultant in, in Brisbane, not c- not connected with us, um, but he told me once that he actually stopped going to his biggest client because they wouldn't do what he told them to do. And I said, what? They wouldn't do what he told them to do. And I said, but you can't tell people what to do. All you can do is advise them. But to come back to um, being a coach, so a coach to me is very like, uh, it's someone who, you're not suggesting ideas, but you're getting the people, you're helping the people to come up with ideas. Um, and I suppose if we look at the word education, it comes from the Greek word eduko, when directly translated into English means to draw out from within. So people practically always have the answer within them, and uh, you draw it out. This is what you're doing as a coach. You're getting them to think differently, um, to look at things differently. And it could be as simple as, you know, just asking a question when there is when something happens and say, um, you know, do you think that maybe you should have thought about that a bit more before you did that? And you're just giving them little pointers, but you're ac- not actually giving them advice. You're getting them to reflect upon themselves, and that's what uh, coaching is. Mm. It's very. I think I was struck there by by when you were talking there about how similar it is to the academic approach that we take. You know, where you're mm. you're looking inward into the person to find what they have to give and making sure that they maximize that you know i remember when i first started in business one of the first bits of advice i was given by somebody who'd been in business many years he says the most important thing you can do is to manage the weaknesses of people rather than their strengths because the strengths will take care of themselves but the weaknesses won't and and i think that's maybe what you're saying. A little bit about the coaching, but not all, of course. I mean, business coaching is more than that. But, you know, where business coaching is looking to find out really what the customer wants or the client wants, where they want to go. And you, as a business coach, fully understanding what their needs are, you know. I think that's something you, you seem to bring out in the lectures quite a bit. Yes, absolutely. And before, obviously, before you would start coaching anyone you need to run through a a sort of a checklist if you like and find out exactly you know what to want what they're looking for and everything else because you need this as a sort of a a roadmap if 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 you like because you're going on a journey with them and you're going to to help them um you're going to guide them somewhat but not as much as a consultant would um because they need to come up with ideas themselves and and reflection themselves um you know it could be 
sometimes reflection on themselves, a reflection on their team, a reflection on their whole organization. If it's a CEO or an owner you're dealing with, or you know, it could even be a board member mm. or director, mm. you know, that you're dealing with. Kind of, I'm, I'm co- kind of coming to something now, and it's it's a journey that because we've known each other for so long, and I've kind of seen this progression in in you, and and ultimately where it brought you for your academic research, you know. Uh, and I know it was a question that always bothered you was about how a company could could and should identify the business they're in, yeah? Yeah. And, of course, we all know the story of McDonald's. What business are they in? That's very true. They're in the real estate business. Exactly. They're not, they're not yeah. restaurants or yeah. not food. It's, it's the real estate business. Yeah. And that's a difficult thing, I think, for a lot of companies to really understand where their DNA is. Absolutely. You know? And that's I was always fascinated by that and that inspired your research in the end which we'll talk about in a second but um you know w- w- just talk to me about this idea of companies not really understanding the business i can give in. you a really good example of a company that i did some work with and it's a firm of electricians and obviously i mean we live in a in a, in a subtropical area and um so air conditioning is a huge thing especially this time of the year because it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and I started working with this firm and I discovered that they did absolutely no networking whatsoever, but they were trying to expand their business. And I said, so, you know, where do you go to network or whatever? And it was something like the Association of Electricians. And I said, I bet you never got any business from there. No. I said, you don't. That's fine, you know, to be in that type of association, but you need to go elsewhere. So I started training them to go to to um, to networking events, and I was able to spot some for them that they should attend, and I went to the first one with them. But there's two guys that own this business. So I asked them, I said, okay, so I'm a stranger, you meet me um, at a networking event, and I walk up to you and I say, how you doing? My name is Brian, what's your name? And you tell me your name, and I said, what do you do? What's your answer to me? Oh, we, we're electricians, we install air conditioners, right? So I said, how about, I said, you do them commercially as well as domestically, yes. And commercial is your growth area, that's where you want to grow, yeah. I said, so how about if you were to say that we provide, we have to provide comfortable environments for people to work in where their productivity level is higher and they love coming to work in the morning to get excited about coming to work. Now have I got your attention? Yes, you have. I said, so do you see what I'm saying to you? Mm. Keep the labels off. Keep the electrician label off. I mean, it's true. I mean, wh- wh- when people find purpose in their work, yeah. they're more likely to work harder, work better, yeah. stay longer, and be happier. Yeah. Southwest Airlines was an example of that. And hopefully our college is an example of that. Yeah. Um, we try anyway. Um, there's another really good example as well, Vinny, um, and I read it in a book by a guy called Mark, I can't give his name, It's the name of the book is What They Don't Teach You at Harvard's Oh, I know the book, I see it on, yeah. b- on shelves in yeah. the airports. And well, well, he actually, he worked with a lot of major sports stars and international brands, but he was having lunch one day in Switzerland with the chairman of Rolex. And um, a man approached the table that knew the chairman and hadn't seen the chairman in a long time looked at him and he said how are things in the in the watch business and the chairman of rolex looked at him and he said i wouldn't know we're not in the watch business we're in the luxury business really good answer mm. really good answer certainly is a luxury <laughs> mm. so i uh, yeah that, that's fascinating brian and uh, your journey then took you to to a major research project where you set out on the the long journey to try and figure out how can companies really understand the business they're in. Yeah. And I think that journey started with this idea of organizational cultural intelligence. Yes. Yeah. So th- can you talk to me about that? And your your ideas generally about culture in organizations? Yeah, well, culture in organizations traditionally um we've had the triangle effect where it starts with the board or the ceo or the business owner and it comes down through the ranks and right down to the bottom but you know 
there are different levels. Like you can walk into any organization as a consultant or as an executive coach, and you can look around and you get an idea, you get a feeling in the office what sort of a place it is, um, you know. And then there are deeper levels where people know what actually happens, and you know, don't ask John that question because he won't be able to answer it. You know, ask Morris because Morris will know the answer and he let you do it or whatever. Um, but cultural intelligence then comes in further down the ranks at the bottom where there are cultures, and I don't think too many people are aware of this, but there are cultures actually forming at the lower levels independent of the people at the top and of the boards and the CEOs and the, and the business owners and that, you know. And I suppose one of the phrases that I use is, you know, well, you know, you've got this process and this is how things are done. But what happens when you're not in the room? And I get senior executives and middle managers to reflect on that for a minute and think about, you know, what actually happens when you're not here? Because there is that culture forming as well. And I suppose how I see it is is that if you create um, a psychological safety, uh, a really good psychological safety in the workplace, which under Australian legislation you have to do now, I, I'm not so sure about here, um, but I imagine it's similar, um, and you create that atmosphere where people, you know, they feel purpose and they want and, and they want the freedom to do and they want to feel safe to express themselves or ask a question. You know, like one of the things I always say is, you know, there are no there's no such thing as a silly question and there's no such thing as a silly answer either. Because this is where ideas come out of. And as an, an experienced non executive director, um, I have to say in the board in the boardroom sometimes what sounds the craziest solution is sometimes the best when you actually think it through yeah. and talk it through. Yeah. I think it's uh, quite extraordinary. If we touch on the academic stuff for a moment on, on Anchor and this living organism, uh, like it through its feedback loops and so on, the company being basically a living organism, one that has life of itself, you know, mm. and that that life is built on the culture that's created all the subcultures as you, you recognized yeah. as well yeah and the idea is that i was fascinated by the cultural intelligence aspect because that's talking more of the dna you know it's talking yeah. more of the self perpetuation if you like of the culture that just happens because the right framework is in place the right leadership structure as you talked about before you know setting the tone and the mm. and the environment quite apart from psychological safety, but, you know, setting the, the tone in the environment where people are happy to come to work. They feel like they're making a difference, whatever that difference might be, you know, whether it's yeah. making their lives better for people or making whatever it might be. Uh, and, and I think it's not an easy thing that can be defined. Um, and I, I think from your research, you discover that. I did indeed. And one of the things that has always fascinated me is I read in many books, culture can be measured. And I wish somebody would tell me how. What are the metrics of measuring culture? Mm. Because, as you know, in my research, I did it all on qualitative because you can't do it on, on no, qualitative. You can't, you can't measure it. No. There's no yardstick you can use. But that was going to bring me to the next question, Brian, really. Um, the, the, the theoretical structure you had to use in the end. It was the resource base view, right? The VRIO framework. Yeah. yeah. I thought yeah. that was a fascinating combination of use and say, okay, so how do we look at culture? How do we measure it? We've got to measure it in people. Mm. We have to look inside the company. We have to look at the resources. Okay, what are the yeah. resources? You know, yeah. which ones are valuable? Which ones are rare? Which ones can't be imitated? And, yeah. and how are they all, all organized together? Yeah. And I think the more I read your research and got it, got into it a bit more the more I realized that, that the path you took was probably the only path you can take to get any kind of an appreciation of what culture is, the essence of it, and how you can actually get inside and try and walk around something that you can't bump your head off, right? It's, that's, that's it's not there. That's very true. You can't drop it on your toe. No. <laughs> it's not there, you know. Uh, you can't sit in it. <laughs> yeah. and but it's there, yeah. right? And believe me, I spent not hours, not days, but weeks and indeed months, you know, thinking about this, thinking on paper, 
trying to come up with it and it just you know whatever and it all started to fall into place for me as well uh, at that stage now there's two things that i want to mention about it as well one is in the vrio so the the i is an imitable which means you know it's nearly copy, impossible copy. To, to, to copy yeah um and i see you know there are organizations that i mean let's call supermarket chain abz limited so abz limited has got they open a supermarket and it's very successful and then they open another one and another one and they have 10 supermarkets and then they suddenly realize there's a different culture in each of them only a few of them are successful yeah even though it's the same owner the culture will never be the same in the in 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 the next one and the strange thing is and i actually asked someone who, who who does this in um in 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 australia for a a, a multi uh, a, a multiple when they open a new store she goes and sets it up and everything else and, and they're a pretty big retailer and i said what about the culture what about if you bring people she says i do bring people that i know who open it and i said is the culture the same in each store even though you've got the same people and she said no it's not it's different it's a different location you know and it just changes like that the other thing that i wanted to say in, in th- they came up as as part of my research was um because i delved into generation z so generation z today is, are up to 27 years of age and i discovered and indeed mckinsey has done a lot of work on this and i've d- recently and i've done my own work on it is to generation z the most important thing to them is flexibility and trust. The second most um, important thing to them is purpose and communication. And the third most important thing to them is actually remuneration. So, you know, we're we're baby boomers, and to us in the generation follows, like, you know, it's, oh, how much an hour or how much a week or what's the salary is nearly the most uh, important thing to the majority. Whereas it's the opposite with Gen Z yeah. and the research has also shown how social media things said on social media be the negative or positive that it's affecting something like 38% of them whereas your generation my generation is only 4% yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and employers need to keep that in mind yeah I mean the culture is a very it's it's a very very difficult uh, in a different fabric and complicated fabric uh, of all of the various age groups there yeah. and, and even you see that we've got some Champions League prop here and things, and, yeah. uh, and, and a lot of the the football managers that I talk to, you know, even the Premier League managers, they would um, often talk about how they have to deal differently with players. The older ones, they less amount. The younger ones, more focused, and tell them, Generation Z, tell me what I need to do. Just yeah. tell me and be clear. Yeah. Tell me when I'm doing it right. Tell me when I'm doing it wrong. No waffle, just give it me. As long as I know what to do, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, but but then again, I mean, you know, the values of humans are the same. And you're talking about now that money is the least most important to Gen Zs. In fact, research shows that money is least important. It's not the most important factor whether you're Gen Z or not. It's just that Gen Zs are further down the yeah. The it thing from money, but um, it's all about I think uh, understanding the culture, and and that's the bit that. I thought it was very good on what you did. Mm. It's the environment you work in, which is the which is the culture, really. If that is right, you know. I mean, one organisation that I've worked with in 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 Brisbane, um, we managed over a period, which is a very short period of time, but in less than two years, we turned our culture around a hundred and eighty degree. Now that started at the top with um, the principal of this organization agreeing to go on a journey with me and i said to him i said you're not going to agree with everything i suggest or whatever he says i'm going on the journey we went on the journey so within in less than two years because of uh, natural attrition where people had moved etc and that his workforce dropped by 40 percent his output went up by about 30 percent his absenteeism days dropped from 34 days a month to just two. And that was just a change in culture. Mm. So my argument is, and it's a huge thing, it's not just a change in culture, it's a huge thing, but my argument is, get the culture right, and the KPIs will look after themselves. Yeah, so, yeah, so I've always, you know, like KPIs to me 
are very secondary to KBIs, which are the key behavioral indicators. Yeah. You know, because yeah. people forget, you know, that they're not what they think and they're not what they say. They are their behaviors and their actions and inactions. So when we come down to it, uh, you know, and the more you think about it, that an organisa- organization is people. Absolutely. A company is people. Yeah. Businesses don't succeed. People no. succeed. No, exactly. And if you don't have the, the let's say the right fit or you create the right environment mm. to help them thrive rather than holding them back and making them feel lousy, yeah. then you're never ever going to achieve yeah. what an organization yeah. can achieve. Yeah. And I must tell you, one of the I, I, I suppose it may become controversial, but one of the things that I that I that I'm very much an advocate of in the past year is you know, if if a boss is on I know I'm talking Australian dollars now. So let's say a boss is on a hundred thousand a year, and someone junior to him is on eighty five, but the junior's output is twenty percent higher than the boss. In my book, the junior should be getting remunerated at a higher level than the boss, and I think that that's what we need to stop looking at. I can't pay. I can't pay Mary that because Johnny is her boss or at a higher level and he's on that so I can't move her up. Well, why not? She's more valuable to the company. It'll take a long time to get that mindset changed, I think. I've made it happen. Well, I won't say I made it, but yeah. I suggested and I know one company it has happened in. Okay, that's, that's yeah. That, get, get this idea of culture, which is really fascinating take on culture. Um, you know, <clears throat> once we identify the culture and we start to identify then or align the kind of business that they're in, of course, the next obvious thing is competitive advantage. Absolutely. And how you can sustain competitive advantage over a longer term. Yeah. How do you see culture supporting that? Well, I think one very basic thing we have to remember is every customer touch point, be it a phone call, an email, an in-person visit, whatever it is, the customer experiences the culture. And if the culture feels good, Getting repeat business is a lot easier, and getting recommendations and referrals is a is is a, is a lot easier. Um, and culture, um, on the face of it, if it is right, not only do the customers want to come back, but when you advertise a position that's available, you will get the best of the best applying for a position to work within that company. Because the best people work in the best companies. <coughs> so basically, employees also refer other employees. Oh, it's, absolutely. It's not just down to customer referral. Yeah, no, it's 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 not. And I mean, the 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 story I told you a few minutes ago about where we turned the 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 culture around, like there were very few people there long enough to be reviewed six months. Now there are three and four year reviews. Mm. Yeah. Because the culture has changed. It, it is fascinating, uh, Brian. And um, we'll just kind of wrap up now and and uh, maybe reflect on the course that we teach and all of the you know, experience we both bring to that. And, and what for you, I know we all probably as professors and lecturers in the college here, we all have our satisfaction points, you know. We mm. all... It's the email from the student that thanks you at the end of the module and say, I couldn't have done it without you, or wh- whatever it might be. Well, that's our job, okay? But it's nice to hear it too. Yeah. Uh, if you would take one key takeaway from the business coaching modules you have run, what, what might it be, to, uh, Brian? I would say that whether the student is going to actually coach or not, to actually apply the knowledge they have learned. Exactly, either to others or to themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I because, agree. Be, because they will excel and they will help those around them excel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great to see you again, Brian. Great to see you too, Vin. And take care. Will do. Thank you. Thank you.